Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Tune In to Safe Healthcare, Reducing Infection in the Outpatient Dialysis Facility, Results of the Standardizing Care to Improve Outcomes in Pediatric End-Stage Renal Disease, or SCOPE Collaborative, hosted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Making Dialysis Safer for Patients Coalition. CDC's mission is to save lives and protect the health and safety of Americans. My name is Preeti Patel, and I'm a medical officer who serves as a dialysis activity leader within the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am also the medical director of the Making Dialysis Safer for Patients Coalition. This webinar is part of a series of infection control-related webinars that CDC hosts along with a variety of external partners and experts. The Making Dialysis Safer for Patients Coalition is a collaboration of diverse organizations who have joined forces with the common goal of promoting the use of CDC's recommended interventions and resources to prevent bloodstream infections in dialysis patients. I am pleased to introduce the featured speakers for our webinar today. Dr. Bradley Warady is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. He is the director of the Division of Nephrology and the director of dialysis and transplantation at Children's Mercy Hospital. Dr. Alicia New is a professor of pediatrics and the division director for pediatric nephrology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is also the director of pediatric dialysis and kidney transplantation at the Bloomberg Children's Center at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Both Drs. Warady and New are members of the project committee for the American Society of Nephrology, or ASN, Nephrologist Transforming Dialysis Safety Initiative. I've had the pleasure of interacting with them on that committee and experiencing firsthand their passion for preventing infections. Drs. New and Warady helped to spearhead the development of the SCOPE Collaborative, the topic of today's presentation, and have remained the faculty leads of the Collaborative since its launch in 2011. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. We welcome your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you have via your chat window located on the lower left-hand side of the webinar screen any time during the presentation. Questions will be addressed after the presentation as time allows. To ask for help, please press the raise hand button located on the top left-hand side of the screen if you need to chat with someone for technical assistance during the webinar. To hear the audio, please ensure your speakers are turned on with the volume up. The audio for today's conference should be coming through your computer speakers. In addition, the speaker slides from today's presentation will be provided to participants in a follow-up email. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. Warrity. Well, thank you, Pretty, very much uh, for that introduction. And I just want to begin by saying that uh, Dr. New and I are, are very honored to be able to uh, uh, provide this webinar to give uh, folks some insight into the activities of the SCOPE Collaborative. Uh, knowing how many people have signed up for this webinar, it's, it's great to hear that there's so many of us uh, around the nation uh, who have, have a goal of decreasing the rate of infection uh, in patients on dialysis, both pediatric and adult patients. I suspect that many of you are not pediatric uh, providers, and so I thought I'd give you two uh, background slides to uh, give you a little bit of insight into pediatric dialysis. This slide is from the 2011 annual report of the NAPRATICS, or the North American Pediatric Renal Trials and Collaborative Studies, an organization that's had a registry of pediatric kidney disease for more than 25 years. And here we're looking at the primary diagnoses associated with the development of end-stage kidney disease in children based on, on some 7,000 children. You'll note that the most common diagnosis is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, or steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, followed by aplastic, hypoplastic, dysplastic kidneys, and obstructive uropathy, uh, the latter generally being posterior urethral valves, and then a host of other disorders. Again, for the adult practitioners, you'll note the absence of systemic hypertension or diabetes mellitus as a cause of end-stage kidney disease in the pediatric population. Now, this next slide, also from the 2011 report of NAPRATIX, uh, looks at the dialysis modality by age group. Uh, you'll note that the PD is in yellow and hemodialysis is in blue, and we divide it into four different age groups at dialysis initiation. So you'll see that in those children who initiate dialysis at less than two years of age, the vast majority uh, are prescribed peritoneal dialysis, some 95%, largely because hemodialysis is very complex in these young infants and there's a lack of adequate vascular access. 
but with increasing age of the children when they're cared for in a pediatric dialysis program, you'll note a progressive increase in the percentage of children uh, who receive hemodialysis, such as, such as in the adolescent population, there's a near equal distribution of children on peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Now, if we were just going to look at adolescent individuals who are cared for in an adult program, the vast majority of those children do, in fact, receive hemodialysis. Now, you might ask, why did we focus on reducing peritonitis uh, in the SCOPE Collaborative as our initial project? And really three major reasons for that. Number one, peritonitis is the leading cause for hospitalization in the pediatric PD patient, not only in the U.S., but globally. Recurrent peritonitis is a leading cause for PD failure and the need to transfer the children to hemodialysis. And then finally, maybe most importantly, infection is a leading cause of mortality in children who receive chronic peritoneal dialysis. This slide reviews the variability in peritonitis rates that we see uh, in the pediatric population. We're looking at peritonitis rate in months between infection. So if we look at the mean data from the NAPRATIX, you can see that the mean rate is about one infection every 28 patient months. This data here is from the International Pediatric Peritoneal Dialysis Network, where the mean infection rate is approximately one infection every 20 patient months. But each of these dots represent the peritonitis rates at different centers across the U.S., different pediatric dialysis centers. So you can see the great variability with these centers having very frequent episodes of peritonitis and this center here having very infrequent peritonitis. And this variability in the peritonitis rate suggests that there is variability in the care provided to these children. And our hypothesis has been that if we can develop more uniform approaches to care, that we would indeed see improvement in the rates, a decrease in infections in these children on chronic PD. So the SCOPE Collaborative is part of the Children's Hospital Association's Quality Transformation Network, which utilizes a quality improvement process to increase implementation of standardized care practices, or as we call them, care bundles. Uh, the system is such that we're utilizing, again, the SCOPE Collaborative, which has experience with CHA, the Children's Hospital Association, uh, in the experience facilitating national collaboratives. CHA has established collaboratives not only with end-stage kidney disease, but a number of other uh, disorders affecting children. Their model also includes multidisciplinary, multi-institutional faculty, which we'll get to in a moment. As I mentioned to you already, the NAPRATIX, that's our data coordinating center. Uh, so all the data is located centrally with the NAPRATIX, and the NAPRATIX has 25 years of experience with data collection in pediatric CKD, dialysis, and transplantation, with data from over 140 pediatric nephrology centers across North America. Now, most important to this collaborative structure are the site teams. As we said before, there are multidisciplinary teams that are testing and implementing the care bundles. Now, in each team, there must be pediatric nephrology representation and pediatric dialysis nurse representation. But there also may be individuals from the QI department, uh, infectious disease, uh, even surgeons. And so the, the makeup of the team and individual sites does vary, but there's always pediatric nephrology and pediatric dialysis nurses. These teams report process and outcome data on a monthly basis, and they participate in workshops and webinars and listservs, and we'll come back to that in a few moments. This is a map that just gives you a visualization of where these sites are that are participating uh, in the SCOPE Collaborative, some 40 sites, as you can see, each represented by a star, and the names of the individual sites are located here around the map. Uh, and virtually all of the largest uh, pediatric dialysis programs in the country are part of this truly national collaborative to decrease peritonitis and exocyte infection in these children on chronic PD. Now, once again, the SCOPE Collaborative is part of this quality transformation network uh, that utilizes quality improvement to increase implementation of standardized care practices. 
This system also requires a process to ensure ongoing, reliable performance of standardized care and the education of and support for teams so if need be they can change behavior to increase the implementation of these standard practices. I want to emphasize from the start that while I'm sharing with you our experiences with the processes in the pediatric dialysis programs, these same processes can most definitely be incorporated into adult dialysis programs as well. So we're going to go over each of these processes in the next few slides. We need to standardize care as part of the SCOPE Collaborative if we hope to decrease peritonitis rates. And so to do that, we've established three sets of care bundles, a PD catheter insertion bundle, which addresses both the intraoperative and the immediate postoperative care of that catheter, the training bundle, which focuses on the training of the patient and family uh, prior to going home on peritoneal dialysis, and then the follow-up care bundle, which addresses the content of the monthly clinic visits and the evaluation and the education that takes place uh, during those periods of time. This slide reviews the content of the PD catheter insertion bundle. So the catheter exocyte orientation is in the lateral or downward position since those positions seem to be associated with the lowest rate of peritonitis in children. A first generation cephalosporin is provided intravenously within 60 minutes prior to the incision for the PD catheter placement. No sutures are utilized at the exocyte to decrease the likelihood of catheter exocyte infection. And postoperatively, the catheter is immobilized to once again decrease the likelihood of exocyte infection. There are no dressing changes within the first seven days and then only in a sterile manner until that exocyte is well healed and then no catheter utilization for the first 14 days. This slide reviews the patient and caregiver training bundle. Now the training is performed by a qualified nurse on a one-to-one -one ratio with that patient and family. Ideally, there's a primary provider and an alternate for each patient. There's appropriate teaching age, and there's unit training protocols that are based upon the content of the pediatric guidelines from the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis. There are specific protocols that are utilized in teaching that address aseptic technique, exit side care, and we utilize the recommendations of the World Health Organization for hand hygiene. Post-training, there's a concept test and a demonstration test, and a home visit is to occur with, again, each training. Finally, our third bundle is the PD catheter and exercise follow-up care bundle. And this is the content of those monthly visits. So at each visit, the exercise is scored by the nurse utilizing a scoring system that was developed by the International Pediatric Peritoneal Dialysis Network. And during each visit, there are key aspects reviewed of hand hygiene, exit site care, and aseptic technique. Now, one component of this bundle that very few sites utilized before the SCOPE Collaborative uh, is the utilization of a six-month demo test and concept test, and that is every six months while that patient is receiving PD. And this is a means to review the retention of the information that has been shared with the patient and the family as part of the training process. There is focused retraining after each peritonitis episode, and then prophylactic antibiotics are used following touch contamination or any other breaks in technique according to the guidelines of the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis. And this is particularly important, important because we see that coag negative staph is one of the most common organisms that gives rise to peritonitis in our patient population. Now, the next important issue to address is auditing. And it's important that we audit our performance so that we can ensure reliable performance of the standardized care. Uh, and if indeed we see that we are not achieving that reliable performance, it allows us to modify behavior to, again, hopefully improve the implementation of these standardized care practices. Now, in most quality processes, one looks at a subset of data and then analyzes that as part of quality improvement. We do something different in scope. We gather compliance data on every catheter insertion, on every initial training session, and on every single follow-up visit. 
so we have a, a robust data set of compliance that helps us, again, uh, achieve the best possible outcome in these children. When we look at compliance in the SCOPE Collaborative, we look at it in a, as an all or none phenomena. So for instance, this is, are the components of the training bundle. Now if we're looking at compliance and training, we have to be compliant in all aspects of the bundles. So for a nurse to say that she has been compliant in conducting the training bundle, she has to be compliant in all of these different elements of that training bundle. It's truly an all or none phenomena, and thus we have a very high bar to achieve in the SCOPE Collaborative, uh, but we think that is the, the best approach to achieving the optimal standardized care practices. Now the next important process uh, in this uh, uh, overall initiative is to teach the clinical teams to change their behaviors and to teach them how to engage patients and families to implement the best practices. And I think this is one of the most important components uh, of this entire initiative, this engagement of patients and families. Clearly, when you're conducting a procedure like peritoneal dialysis that occurs in the home, we have to have a seamless partnership between the clinical team and the patients and families if we hope to achieve the best success. And so I think this has been an integral component uh, of scope that is now being shared uh, across our collaborative. We teach the clinical teams to use quality improvement methodology to increase implementation of these standardized care practices. And the model employed by SCOPE is the model for improvement. And this includes the use of plan, do, study, act cycles, or PDSA cycles, small tests of change that drive improvement. Also crucial in this entire process is developing a culture of safety. Patient safety, especially infection prevention, must be a priority in the dialysis unit of every member of the healthcare team, including the patients and their families. And all of these stakeholders must be empowered to implement that, that, that change if we hope to achieve the best outcome. This is an example of the PDSA cycles and the improvement that was experienced at one of our centers. This is data from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Here we're looking at monthly compliance rates as well as a rolling 12-month cumulative compliance rates for insertion compliance reflected by the red line, training compliance reflected by the blue line, and follow-up compliance by the green line. I'm going to focus here uh, on the 12-month rolling data on the insertion compliance. You can see early on there was zero compliance uh, in terms of the insertion processes, but over time there were marked improvement again following the introduction of these three different uh, products following their PDSA cycles, most recently the catheter insertion checklist. This is the checklist that's been used by Nationwide Children's Hospital, and I'm not going to go into great depth about the checklist, other than to say that the checklist includes information on the proper antibiotic to use prior to catheter insertion, the dose of the antibiotic, uh, what to do postoperatively, how to address the exit site, and a host of factors all that address optimal catheter care. Now what's important is not only did this product assist the folks at Nationwide Children's Hospital in improving their outcome, but this product was shared amongst all the collaborative sites and incorporated into other sites as well to improve their outcome. So the sharing of resources among collaborative sites within SCOPE has been another key product and something that has lent itself to improved outcomes across all 40 centers participating in the collaborative. Next we need to support the teams with monthly transparent data and networking sessions, another key aspect of the SCOPE Collaborative. And this slide is the home page of the NAPRATIX just to highlight the fact that there's real-time data that is available to be shared among all the sites in a transparent manner that are participating in SCOPE. So these data, like I said, are real-time, and anyone can see anybody else's data. This is very, very important for the quality improvement process. Centers need to be able to track their own data so they can see how they are doing, and they can identify areas where they are struggling and where some change of behavior may be helpful. 
They can also view other centers' data to allow them to identify centers who are doing well so that they can reach out to those centers and learn from their experience. Something else that, again, is incorporated into our DNA in pediatrics and could also be utilized by adult providers. I'm going to quote Jane Stewart. Jane works with us at CHA, and she stated that the model for this philosophy of transparency is to steal shamelessly and share seamlessly. And that's something that all of us practice uh, in the Scope Collaborative. Now, we also share information on, on the volume of data that we're receiving with all of our participants. So this is an example is data that we share with our team, uh, data collected between October 2011 and October 2016. So you can see we had over 1,200 enrollments and over uh, information on more than 1,000 catheter insertions. We have information on almost 1,100 training sessions and 15,000 follow-up forms, and information on 833 infections, nearly 600 episodes of peritonitis, and 237 episodes of exit site or tunnel infections. So this robust database allows us to analyze these data and hopefully generate important information uh, that may ultimately be incorporated into bundles and, and help us decrease the rate of peritonitis. We also share information with our teams uh, on the rate of infection. And here we're looking at data on the aggregate monthly exocyte infection rate. So here we're looking at months between infections. This is all exocyte infections. And this is the same data, but characterized by infections per patient year. Now here we're looking at the months over time. And I think what should be evident to you is the great variability that occurs on a month-to-month -month basis uh, and the number of infections that are seen across the collaborative. But if we look at it as a 12-month rolling average, you can see that there has indeed been a gradual improvement uh, in the exocyte infection rate. Once again, here's months between infection, the rolling 12-month cumulative data, and here's the infections per patient year. And so you note that early on, in October 2011, the annualized rate was somewhere around 0.38 infections per patient year and we progressively improved to somewhere around 0 0.15, 0 0.14 infections per patient year. Other data that we share with our team uh, related to exercise is data like this, a control chart. So here we're looking at, once again, the annualized infection rate. And we're looking here at data just on 22 centers who provided us with historical data before the initiation of the collaborative, and then looking at the experience of those same centers following the initiation of the collaborative. So here's the historical data and the mean pre-study rate here. And here's the post-collaborative data over 57 months. These are the monthly collaborative rates of exocyte infection. And you can see that we've seen a progressive improvement, still more work to be done, but a progressive improvement, about a 25% decrease in the rate of exocyte infections. But I show you this as just another example of the kind of data that we share with all the sites uh, within our collaborative on a regular basis to point out our success and to point out the challenges that are still in front of us. Now, while looking at infection rate is critically important, we look at another outcome metric, and that is of the, the fiscal impact of infection prevention. And we do that by combining the data from SCOPE uh, with data from the FIS, uh, a database that is the Pediatric Health Information System that's a database that includes information from more than 45 children's hospitals across the nation, including fiscal data. And by combining these data, we find to date that the median cost of a, a treatment of peritonitis is about $14,000 per episode, with higher costs associated with patients who experience an ICU stay, who experience septic shock in association with their hospitalization, or who have developed fungal peritonitis. Now you might ask, well, where does all this networking occur? And I think this is, again, critically important to the success of SCOPE. So we have monthly webinars. And in those webinars, we have the participation of one or more representatives from virtually all 40 centers that are participating in SCOPE. The webinars may be educational sessions. We may be sharing challenging cases. We may be discussing potential new initiatives. But it's a way to truly hear from one another's experience. Maybe the most important networking opportunity is the twice-yearly face-to-face learning sessions that we have. 
This gives us an opportunity to sit at the same table with individuals, learn from their expertise and their insight that we can incorporate into our own sites. We hear failures, we hear success stories. And I think all of that has allowed us to then generate more PDSI cycles, more improvement that's been shared across the collaborative. So this is the kind of interaction, again, it's occurring here in pediatrics. It certainly can occur in adult programs as well and is key to the improvement processes that we're experiencing. There's an e-group listserv. There's a practice inventory where the nurses are collecting information on PD practices, not only those that are within the bundle, but even outside the bundle. And the, again, review of that information lends itself to more information in terms of how we might decrease infection risk in our patients. And then there's regular online sharing of resources amongst all the participants from the collaborative. Finally, we need to scientifically assess the impact of our effort. We need to take all of the data that we've collected, we need to analyze the data, and we need to publish that data so that it can be shared amongst the dialysis community, both perineal dialysis and hemodialysis, both pediatric and adult. And so now I'm going to hand over the microphone, if you will, to Alicia New. She's going to review the analysis of the data that we've collected on PD, and she'll also introduce the new initiative in scope, that of the assessment of hemodialysis patients. So Alicia, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Brad. So again, as, as Dr. Wardy said, the final step in the QI process is a scientific assessment of the impact of the effort. And he's already shown you how we continuously assess that impact using control charts. And as he mentioned, we intermittently perform rigorous statistical analyses on all of the data that we collect on all these patients. And we recently published the results of an analysis of the first three years of scope. Um, these were published in KI, and the title page from that uh, manuscript is shown on this slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll briefly uh, re review the results of that analysis, which focused on the improvement in follow-up bundle compliance and the change in peritonitis rates over those first three years of the collaborative. As, as Dr. Wardy mentioned, there are currently 40 pediatric dialysis units participating in SCOPE, but in order to be included in the analysis that I'm presenting, a center had to be in the collaborative at the time of launch in October of 2011, and there were 29 centers at that time. The analysis was further limited to those centers which had provided patient and infection counts for the 13 months prior to launch, or historic data, to which the post-launch infection rates could be compared. 24 centers met these criteria, from which there were 644 patient enroll, enrollments, 751 catheter insertions, 319 training sessions, and 7,977 follow-up forms submitted in the first 36 months of the collaborative. As uh, mentioned by Dr. Wardy, compliance for all three bundles is assessed as all or none, meaning that every patient's catheter insertion training session or follow-up event had to comply with all of the elements of the respective bundle to be considered compliant. Infection rates for each center were calculated as an annualized rate using the formula shown on this slide. And then the collaborative rates were calculated as the mean of the center rates. So I should emphasize that although more than 640 patients were enrolled in the collaborative, because the central hypothesis of scope is that more uniform practices across centers will lead to a reduction in infection rates at those centers. For statistical purposes, the unit of interest in, is the dialysis facility and not the patients. So the effective sample size for these, um, this analysis is 24. This slide shows the monthly compliance with each of the care bundles over time with PD catheter insertion bundle in blue, the training bundle in orange, and the follow-up care bundle in green. Note the significant month-to-month -month variability in both the training and catheter insertion compliance. This is in large part due to the low number of these events. We would typically get between 2 and 25 catheter, or inser uh, catheter insertion or training events reported every month. In addition, it's related, again, to the all or none compliance scoring. So if you completed 90% of the insertion bundle, you don't get a score of 90, you get a score of zero. 
Conversely, the average number of follow-up events is about 250 per month. And as you can see, across the collaborative, the follow-up care compliance slowly but steadily increased over the first three, three years of the collaborative. Um, but, and so it increased so that by just over two years after the collaborative launch, we hit a level of 80% compliance with follow-up care. Changes in bundle compliance over time were assessed using generalized linear mixed model techniques, which confirmed that the probability of compliance with the follow-up care bundle increased significantly over the first 36 months of the collaborative. That's highlighted here in the red box. Not surprisingly, given the variability in compliance and the small number of events every month, these models could not detect a significant increase in compliance with either the insertion or the training bundle. Although it's impressive that we were able to ultimately achieve 80% compliance with the follow-up bundle, there may be some in the audience who are wondering why it took us over two years to reach this level of compliance. As a reminder, the PD catheter follow-up bundle requires that hand hygiene, exit site care, and aseptic technique be reviewed with the patient and the caregiver at every single follow-up visit. The bundle also requires that the patient and family demonstrate competence with these procedures using both a concept and demonstration test every six months. Again, compliance is scored as all or none. So if you review exit site care and hand hygiene but not aseptic technique, you get scored as a zero for that follow-up event. The, the PD providers in the audience will immediately recognize the difficulty in getting all of these bundle elements into an already busy PD clinic visit that requires review not only of infection prevention, but also the many other aspects of the care of these complex patients. Thus, it's not surprising that centers may be able to implement some, but not all of the bundle elements consistently at every single visit. In fact, this figure shows both the monthly overall compliance with the follow-up bundle here in this solid line, along with the compliance with each of the subcomponents in the various dotted lines. Note that compliance with nearly all of the elements individually achieved a 70 to 80 percent compliance level within a few months of the launch, but overall compliance, which again requires that we do every single one of these things in every single visit, did not reach 80 percent until the fall of 2013. Again, if you were previously surprised that it took us over two years to get 80%, you, now, you may now be surprised that we got there at all. And achieving this level of compliance was only possible because the entire care team at each center participated in the quality improvement process. Each center, as, as Dr. Wardy mentioned, is charged with developing ideas to increase compliance. They are to test them in a few patients. They get feedback from the entire healthcare team and from the patients and then they either spread it to other patients if it was successful, or if it wasn't successful, they go back to the drawing board. They modify it and try again. These small tests of change. Uh, the, de the development and testing of ideas does not stop at the individual dialysis unit. And as, as Dr. Wardy said, the strength of a scope collaborative is the sharing of resources. Ideas, processes, tools, experiences, and resources are shared and stolen freely across the Scope Collaborative. This slide shows examples of some of the resources that have been developed and shared across the Collaborative to increase follow-up compliance. Some centers, some fortunate centers, have a dedicated nurse educator to, whose sole job during the PD visit is to make sure that the topics of exit site care, hand hygiene, and aseptic technique are reviewed. Many centers have developed visual aids, such as posters or flip charts, to help in the review. And then one of the most popular um, methods is to have the patient or the family actually perform the exit site care in the clinic. This not only allows you to review hand hygiene and exit, exit site care, but also allows you to have a demonstration of the competence during that visit. Not only is it difficult to include all of the reviews in each and every visit, but review fatigue is a significant problem. It doesn't matter how fancy your flip chart is. If it's the only resource you have to review exit site care, it doesn't take long, long before it's no longer an effective review. 
Again, the sharing of resources is incredibly important, and this slide shows examples of some of the techniques to minimize review fatigue that have been shared across the collaborative. This includes having the patient or their family monitor the hand hygiene practices of the providers in clinic. That includes everyone, the doctor, the nurse, the dietitian, the social worker. Another very popular technique is to use GlowGerm. For those of you who are not familiar with GlowGerm, it's a substance that's visible under black light. And so the patient or their family puts the GlowGerm on their hands, they then perform hand hygiene, um, and then they put their hand under a black light, and any areas where the hand hygiene wasn't effective will glow. It's very popular, particularly among adolescent boys. Um, many centers have uh, you developed video games, and the picture here in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide is a video game that we developed here at Hopkins. And in it, our dialysis nurse, Barbara Case, intentionally makes mistakes at several steps of the uh, aseptic technique and the patient is instructed to click the mouse whenever they see a mistake, and the video game immediately tells them whether they've correctly identified a mistake. And then finally, some centers will have the patient or family record themselves performing the dialysis procedure in the home. Every patient and caregiver has to demonstrate competence with this procedure, but there's a difference between performing the procedure in a clinic and performing it in the home on a day-in and day-out basis. So they record themselves performing the procedure using a phone or a tablet. They then bring the, the recording into the clinic where it's reviewed with a nurse or a nurse educator, educator in an open and a non-accusatory environment. The patient and the family are reminded that the goal of the review is not to place blame, but to identify ways to improve their technique. These are just a few of the examples of the many resources that have been developed across the collaborative. As Dr. Wardy mentioned, they're shared by centers on the e-group or maybe presented on the monthly webinars or, or at our face-to-face -face learning sessions. And then they're made available on the, uh, online at the CHA or the Children's Hospital Association website. Moving from compliance to infection rates, because again, the, the goal of the collaborative is not just to get people to do all these things during clinic, but rather to see whether or not all these things actually can reduce infection rates. Among the 24 centers included in this analysis, there were 206 peritonitis episodes reported, over 3,778 patient months in the 13 months prior to the collaborative launch. These same centers reported 320 infections over 8,853 patient months in the 36-month post-launch period. While it is tempting to compare these two crude rates, we need to remember that the post-launch rate here includes the entire 36 months following collaborative launch, including that two-year period when the implementation of the follow-up care bundle was low. Thus, a comparison of these rates would not test the hypothesis that more uniform delivery of care will reduce infection rates because it includes in the post-op period a time, or a post-launch, not post-op, post-launch period, when, uh, a time when care was not uniform. In order to test that hypothesis, you have to look at average monthly peritonitis rates, which allows you to detect trends in rates over time. To do this, a model was fit using average monthly peritonitis rates, and this analysis revealed a statistically significant reduction in monthly peritonitis rates from a rate of 0.63 episodes per patient year to a rate of 0.42 episodes per patient year at 36 six months post-launch. This slide shows the average monthly peritonitis rates in the pre-launch period to the left of this red um, or a vertical line, and the 36-month post-launch period to the right of this line. Also displayed is the monthly follow-up compliance here in the green dotted line. These data graphically suggest that as follow-up bundle compliance increased, the variability in peritonitis rates decreased. In order to determine the level of follow-up compliance required to achieve a significant decrease in infection rates, we performed a sensitivity analysis in which we compared the peritonitis rates in the pre-launch period, oops, sorry, let me go back one slide, in the pre-launch period here with rates following achievement of various levels of follow-up compliance. So the rates were 
in this time period were compared to this, this time period to this. The results of that analysis are shown on this slide. The mean compliance threshold is here in the first, compliance, uh, first column, and the ratio of peritonitis rates in the pre-launch period over the rate in the time period after achievement of each of the compliance threshold is shown in this fourth column. Since it is a ratio of pre-launch rates over post-launch rates, the lower the rate after the compliance threshold is reached, the larger the ratio. This analysis confirmed that as mean compliance increased, the peritonitis rates decreased, so the ratio increased, reaching statistical significance at a mean compliance of 80%, at which the pre-launch peritonitis rate was 42% higher than the rate in the months following achievement of this level of compliance. Although I hope you'll agree with me this, that this is impressive, our work is not done, and the SCOPE centers continue to work to maintain compliance with the follow-up bundle and to increase compliance with the insertion and training bundles. We've also developed research groups which have, uh, within the collaborative which have tried to identify whether there are clinical or demographic factors or even other care practices that may influence infection rates. We've also developed innovation groups that have uh, sought to optimize care practices not specifically included in the bundles, including improving identification and treatment of touch contamination, developing health literacy sensitive education and review materials, and increasing patient and family engagement in the quality improvement process. We now move to the hemodialysis project, and as Dr. Wardy mentioned, it is our, our more recent project, and it launched in uh, 2013. Like the PD project, the HD project seeks to reduce HD access-related infections by increasing implementation of standardized care practices. While it is well recognized that the single most effective way to minimize HD access-related infections is to reduce the use of catheters, it's also well known that catheter use remains common in pediatric patients. This slide is taken from the USRDS, and it shows hemodialysis access type among prevalent pediatric patients, hemodialysis patients, in the United States. As you can see, a majority of children, and particularly young children, continue to have a catheter as their hemodialysis access. There are many reasons for this, including the fact that the majority of children on dialysis actually receive a kidney transplant within two years of reaching ESRD, and so a more permanent access is not always warranted. In addition, it may not be technically feasible, as Dr. Wardy mentioned, to create a uh, vascular access, and specifically an AV fistula, in a very small child. Thus, any effort to minimize HD access-related bloodstream infections in children must include efforts aimed at reducing catheter-associated infections. Therefore, the HD project includes standardized practices for accessing tunneled catheters, as well as AV fistulas and AV grafts. The specific practices included in the HD catheter connection procedure is shown on this slide and includes the requirement for hand hygiene using the WHO protocol and appropriate personal protective equipment for the provider and a mask for the patient. The protocol does require scrubbing of the catheter hub with an appropriate antiseptic solution. While the scub, scope bundle was largely based on the recommendations from the CDC, it does differ from the CDC recommendations in that it allows sodium hypochlorite to be used to scrub the hub. In addition, the procedure for povidine iodine does not specifically include a scrub, but rather applying and allowing the agent to dry according to manufacturer recommendations. SCOPE is planning to work with the CDC to evaluate these practices and the bundle elements to more closely align with CDC recommendations. After the hub is prepped, the catheter is connected to the lines using aseptic technique. The provider then removes gloves and performs hand hygiene. The hemodialysis disconnection um, cap chain procedure is shown on this slide. Again, it largely follows the CDC guidelines, except some additional agents are allowed for the hub scrub. The agents that are um, included in the scope bundle are shown here, and the agents that are consistent or, or included in the CDC recommendations are shown bolded. 
This slide shows the protocol for dialysis catheter exit site care and dressing change. And as with all the protocols, require proper hand hygiene and PPE. The agents for prepping the catheter exit site and the allowable antibiotic ointment or creams applied to the exit site differ slightly from the CDC recommendations. And again, with the uh, agents included in the CDC recommendations being bolded on this slide. Again, after the uh, dressing change, well, the um, frequency of dressing change uh, is shown here on the slide, and it depends on the type of the dressing change used. After the dressing is changed, the uh, provider should remove their gloves and perform hand hygiene. The procedure or the protocol for accessing an AV fistular graft is shown here and includes that the patient should wash the site with soap and water. Proper hand hygiene and appropriate PPE are used by the provider unless self-cannulation is performed. The site is prepped with an, an acceptable antiseptic solution. And again, the acceptable solutions in the scope bundle are shown with the CDC recommended solutions bolded. After inserting, after inserting the needles with aseptic technique, the gloves are removed and appropriate or uh, uh, hand hygiene is performed. Finally, the decannulation procedure is shown here and includes the appropriate hand hygiene both prior to and after the procedure and appropriate PPE. As with the PD project, the HD project requires that all patients cared for in the unit be enrolled in the project. Obtain a data, obtaining data at the patient level is included in order to identify clinical and demographic characteristics that may increase risk for infection, especially in high-risk populations. This slide details the data collection process for individual patients enrolled in the collaborative. Unlike the PD project, it is not required that every single procedure in the hemodialysis unit be audited. It would obviously be too labor intensive to audit every single time a patient's access was connected and disconnected from the tubing. Therefore, centers are advised to audit a random sample of those procedures every month. They're encouraged to rotate the audit so that every shift and as many providers are audited as possible. As noted in the top half of the slide, the targeted number of audits is twice the number of patients cared for in a unit with a maximum of 30 audits per month. Obviously, this means that not every patient enrolled will have a connection or disconnection audited. In order to ensure that patient level practices are captured on every enrolled patient, centers are also asked to provide a follow-up form which includes care practices for every patient at least annually. Just as for PD, the data are submitted online and they're available for, re, uh, for centers to review in real time. And we obviously also review the data on our webinars and at our workshops. And the data shown on this slide were presented at the workshop last fall, at which time there were 25 centers entering data. From these sites, nearly 500 patients had been enrolled and nearly 5,000 audits or observations had been submitted. This includes more than 3,000 audits of procedures involving catheters and more than 1,300 involving AV fistulas or grafts. The, break, grafts. the breakdown of those audits are shown on the slide. 77 infections reported during the over 4,300 catheter months of follow-up and two infections reported in o nearly 1,800 fistula graft months of follow-up. Note that centers are asked to report any positive blood cultures or other infection events, and then each of these events is centrally adjudicated by an infectious diseases specialist to determine if the event qualifies as an access-associated infection. So these, ne these numbers represent the adjudicated infections. This slide shows the monthly compliance with the care bundles across the collaborative with catheter care compliance in red and AV fistula, AV graft care compliance in blue. Each point um, shows the compliance for that care bundle in that month. In general, compliance with AV fistula and graft care is quite high. Compliance with the catheter bundle is more variable and hovers between 60 and 90 percent, I'm sorry, 60 and 80 percent, although it has increased slightly in, over the last few months. A compliance deep dive at our last learning session in the fall revealed that failure to apply an antibiotic ointment or cream at the exit site at the time of a dressing change was the single most important contributor to non-compliance with the catheter bundle. This slide shows the monthly rate of catheter-associated infections across the collaborative following collaborative launch in June of 2013. The rates are presented as the number of infections per 100 patient months. 
Unlike the PD project, which had a uniform launch date for the initial 29 sites, meaning all centers began implementing the bundles and collecting and submitting data in October 2011, that HD project has allowed a rolling launch. That is, centers can begin implementation and enrollment any time after June 2013. The number of patient months and, and events is along the x-axis. And as you can see, for the first year and a half or so, there were very few centers entering data, which was relayed to delays in obtaining IRB approval, consent, and ensuring that all of the providers were trained according to the bundles prior to the center launch. As such, the number of patient months and the number of events was relatively low. As the number of centers and therefore patients increased, the rates actually increased to more accurately reflect the rates across multiple centers rather than just a few. As you can see, as time has gone on, although there continues to be some variability, the rates have begun to drop. And since November 2015, the monthly bloodstream infection rate, catheter-associated bloodstream infection rate, has been less than two infections per 100 patient months. Again, these data suggest that the rates are decreasing, but this chart doesn't allow us to compare the rates prior to and after implementation of the care bundles at any center or across the collaborative. Conversely, this chart, which is a U-chart, allows us to do just that. And these are data taken from 15 centers that provided historic data, that is, infection counts and patient counts for the 12 months prior to the implementation of the bundles in their unit as well as the rates following implementation of those bundles. And uh, this chart represent, represents or um, provides the results that show a 32.5% decrease in infection rate from a rate of four episodes or bloodstream infections per 100 patient months prior to launch to 2.7 catheter-related bloodstream infections uh, per 100 patient months after launch. As the number of centers and patients enrolled increases, and in particular as we obtain historic data from additional centers, we will be able to perform uh, statistical analyses as we have for the PD project. I'd like to close uh, very quickly by acknowledging all of the SCOPE team members, and especially our patients and their families, whose hard work uh, Brad and I have had the great privilege to present today, and who continue to work tirelessly to improve the care and the lives of children with end-stage renal disease. We recognize that we've covered a tremendous amount of information in a very short period of time, but our hope is that we've conveyed to you that quality improvement can successfully reduce access-related infections in dialysis patients. Although SCOPE is focused on children with ESRD, as Dr. Wardy said, the basic tenets of the project can be applied to even the largest adult dialysis facility. The keys to the success include engaged and, and empowered, uh, I'm sorry, the keys to the success include creating a culture of safety in which every healthcare provider and every patient is engaged and empowered to minimize infection. And again, using small tests of change to bring about improvement and spreading those changes to other patients, other shifts, and potentially even other units. Um, we have just a few minutes here um, seven minutes or so to be able to take a few questions, but we have provided our contact information on this slide. Please feel free to reach out to me or Dr. Wardy or Jane Stewart at the Children's Hospital Association if you have any questions or want to learn more about SCOPE. Thank you, Dr. New and Dr. Wardy, for your time and expertise today and for sharing with us your experiences. Uh, we have a few questions that have come in. Uh, just a reminder to please submit your questions via the chat window if you have additional questions located on the lower left-hand side of the webinar screen. Um, so the first question for our presenters um, that has come in via the chat window is, what tools do you have to help get family members engaged? Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that first. I don't. Um, I, I think the first thing is to um, incorporate the family members uh, into the discussion of, of patient care. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've done in our own center to begin to get them engaged is to actually have them participate uh, in root cause analyses that take place following the development of the infection. Uh, in one of our own uh, patients who developed peritonitis 
having the family sitting at the table uh, and providing their perspective on infection risk uh, was extraordinarily valuable to our healthcare providers and, and was truly a great example of an engagement of the patient and the family uh, into uh, improving the outcomes of the patient. So I think that is one way we get them engaged. And one other way that we get them engaged is that we have a regular uh, uh, meetings, if you will, with the dialysis families with no agenda uh, other than things that they want to address to improve the care of their children. And I, and I think that's very different than a, a clinic atmosphere uh, where everyone's on a tight, a tight timeline to get the work done. Uh, but having a, a, a session where there's just uh, an agenda really generated by the families themselves uh, I think allows us to really build on that partnership between the healthcare providers uh, and the families and it, I think it really lends itself to uh, engagement. Alicia? I agree, Brad, and I think, again, um, engaging them in the process, the QI process, is very important. You know, we're implementing some of these things, the educational and the review materials, and so we seek their feedback and we ask them for ideas. You know, we're reviewing this with you every week or every month. Do you have ideas of how we can make this better? Um, and, and they like getting involved in that way. I think most centers also um, have the, uh, their data posted in the clinic, uh, and you know, it's pointed out to the patients and the families, so they can, they can share in the improvements and share in the results every time they come into the clinic. I do want to point out one other thing that we do on a, on a regular basis is that we look at our results, and, and we have uh, thankfully experienced uh, great success uh, as part of our uh, involvement in the collaborative in terms of decreasing infection rates. And we regularly thank the families, thank the patients for their contribution to those great results. Because again, if we're focused on a home therapy, we recognize that while we provide the education and the oversight, it's the families and the patients that are conducting the therapy on a, on a nightly basis. And so it is that partnership, and I think we have to recognize uh, their significant contribution to the great outcomes we're experiencing. Right. And I, I think that can translate to the HEMO unit as well. I mean, we're part of the auditing of the connection and disconnection. That most, many, many centers have someone auditing the procedure. And so the patient or the family knows that that's what's going on. Um, and they can take part in that process. They know that uh, preventing infection is important and, and that the unit takes it seriously. And they can um, share in that. We have a couple of other um, attendees who are asking similar questions about what kinds of materials are available on the SCOPE website. I, I believe that most of what you showed when it comes to you know, facility-specific information uh, would be presumably available to, just to those facilities that are participating in SCOPE, but are there other materials that are available more broadly? There are some materials that are available more broadly. You're exactly right. The data. Uh, the center-specific data are on a separate website. Um, there's also some material that is, is on a scope-specific site uh, in the Children's Hospital Association, and so you actually have to register to get on it, but, but most of it is publicly available. I think we have some people from the association. They could correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong on the call. Alicia, just to clarify some of the... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to... Well, I just... I just want to emphasize if there are any pediatric dialysis programs that are listening to the webinar that are not participants in SCOPE to date, uh, they certainly have the uh, opportunity to join the SCOPE Collaborative by, again, contacting either Children's Hospital Association uh, or Alicia or myself. Thanks, Betty. Just to clarify, Alicia, were you saying that most of the tools are available publicly? Many of the tools are available on the on the website, and again, I'm trying to search out some folks on the can confirm that as well. And we're certainly happy to share. I mean, that one of the goals of the Children's Hospital Association is to spread what we have learned in Scope beyond the Scope Collaborative. Um, and so, you know, this kind of forum and sharing the information with other dialysis units is certainly part of the mission of the Children's Hospital Association. So we'll we'll try to make sure we can get those things available. 
That's all the time we have today for answering questions. For those of you who submitted questions that weren't answered, we'll try to send out some information to address some of those by email after the, um, after the presentation. I did want to just mention one other comment that was submitted, not a question, that just says um, kudos to all of those who were involved in the SCOPE Collaborative. This is a, a true collaborative effort, so I wanted to pass that along to the presenters and anybody else from SCOPE who might be joining us today. Um, so before we end today's webinar, um, I wanted to mention that to receive continuing education, you must complete and pass the post-test activity at at least 75% or greater and complete the webinar evaluation. So when you close out of this webinar, a post-meeting web page will appear that will have detailed instructions about completing the continuing education post-test and evaluation. For those on the phone who currently aren't logged in to ReadyTalk Online to obtain CE, please go to www.cdc.gov backslash TCE online. The access code for this webinar is WC0131. A follow-up email will also be sent out this afternoon with detailed instructions about completing the continuing education post-test and evaluation. With that, I'd like to once again thank our speakers as well as all of you for taking the time to join us today and for your commitment to keeping patients safer.